Welcome to the Creative Baggage Podcast. I'm your host, Serena. And I'm Justin. We're here to unpack our creative baggage, share innovative ideas, and help you build a fulfilling creative career. Today's episode features a special guest. Hello, my name is Hannah Cole. Um, I am an artist and um, also a tax professional, and I'm the founder of Sunlight Tax. I teach artists and creative people how to organize for taxes, how to set up their business, and also how to kind of do the hard stuff like setting up retirement accounts and learning how to invest so that the money inside those accounts is growing. Because basically, I believe in what creative people do. And I think that in order to do it more effectively and have a bigger impact, you need financial security. I would love to know how you got started in this very specific niche. Were you an artist at first? Did you study accounting and then kind of develop an interest in artists? How did it begin? Oh, sure. Yeah. No, I am an artist first. I always knew I wanted to be an artist when I grew up, like from the moment I could hold a crayon. Um, (laughs) So (laughs) um, people used to ask me, uh, yeah, what I wanted to be when I grew up and I knew. So I was an artist. And when I graduated from my MFA painting program in 2005, um, I just, you know, walked out into the world feeling like a professional and got hit in the face like a shovel. Like, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to do about my taxes? (laughs) Like, how does this work? And, um, And I had such an awful and demoralizing experience um, hiring my dad's accountant. I mean, a lot of people, that's what we do. We go to our dad's accountant. Um, And I literally did exactly that. And this guy just like treated me like I was some alien creature. I had, you know, like he was like, I was lucky to get some of his time, even though I was paying fully for it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was so intimidated by him, by the fact that I didn't know the terminology. I didn't know tax language. I didn't know like business terms. And he thought that meant I was stupid. Right. And he treated me like some kind of dilettante hobbyist. And, um, it was humiliating. I paid a lot of money and I got nothing out of it. Um, I ended up throwing out the tax return he did because, um, I had looked up tax rules. Like I was really genuinely trying to do this right. And, um, I had had two residencies out West in that year. And, you know, like I was doing big things, right? Yeah. And um, I diligently tracked my mileage to those residencies because I knew it was deductible. And he like just ignored it. He missed that. It was like a $4,000 deduction and he just missed it. And it just occurred to me like, oh, I don't even rate as like a real client to him. Mm. Um, And so that experience really stuck with me, um, how disrespected and judged I felt sitting in that room. Um, just because I didn't go to business school and didn't know the words, so like, I'm not a stupid person. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, that was kind of one of those formative experiences. And then there's many more, I can tell you the short version or the long version, you know, later in life, I mean, one of the things that really hit me was when I had a baby, the economics of my studio really changed. Um, so I had been a professional artist for about maybe 10, not quite 10 years when I had a a kid. And, um, suddenly all that studio time, like I make these very, very detailed paintings, um, that require just a lot of labor. And that wasn't such a hard thing to do when I didn't have to support anybody. But suddenly when now I need to hire a babysitter at $15 an hour to go make those laborious paintings, the economics just didn't work anymore. Mm. And so like living on, and also like living on beans and get, just getting by, that feels really different when you bring another human being into the picture. <laughs> yeah. I can. Um, so I just really had a kind of a come to Jesus um, moment in my life. Lots of difficult <laughs> difficult, long nights of the soul. Um, but ultimately the decision I made was to go back to school for accounting, um, which is what I did with a baby and then pregnant with my second baby. Um, I went back to school for accounting. I studied taxes and then I trained in two different tax firms in New York city, um, kind of learned the ropes took what I wanted to out of those firms, which I truly did not enjoy working for (laughs) because they were like, you know, 
I felt like a wolf in sheep's clothing in there. Like I just, it was like, I can, I can kind of code shift or code switch and like be around accountants and speak like one and act like one, but I feel like an artist in my heart. And so I was like, I can't wait to start my own company for artists. That was, that was the vision always from day one going back to school. So I did it. My company's called Sunlight Tax and now it exists. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I found, I think I found your Instagram account somehow through related accounts because we do kind of have similar missions. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I went right on your website and I downloaded the PDFs for like performer taxes and (laughs) freelance taxes, like anything that was related to me. Um, Awesome. And it it was just so lovely to see, you know, it was beautiful. It was colorful. Tax documents usually are very wordy looking and scary looking. And I, mm-hmm. I'll i admit it, if I look at something and it looks like scary looking, then I won't read it properly. <laughs> <laughs> so, totally. <laughs> so like to have the colors in like an intuitive way and to have the breakdown, I mean, this is like kind of. I'm not technically even out of school yet, but I'm kind of looking ahead into next year when I'm done with my diploma and thinking about like, wow, I have so many different, like I have a piecemeal career. I have so many different random income streams and none of them are super consistent. And I feel like this is something that we definitely don't get in school either. So. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I know. (laughs) I mean, I have, I have some real personal, um, strong, strong opinions on that. Like I mean, I will be honest, I have a whole article on my blog that you could go find where I can link in your show notes if you'd like called, uh, like why are, you know, taxes are anyway, I can't remember the article title, but it's about the fact that taxes are a mandatory civic obligation and yet we don't get educated in them. And I, I just think that's wrong on its face. I think that's wrong. I think every single person in the U S should be educated about their taxes in high school. I think it should be part of a civics education. Um, so a lot of us feel in the dark and we feel really confused. And the fact is like, well, of course you are like, you never got an education in it. Like nobody did. So it's, it's not, it's not, you're not born with a sense of what a section 179 expense is. You know, you have to learn. These things. True. <laughs> yeah. I love that combination. I think we, we talk a lot about interdisciplinarity here and, and mm-hmm. your experience, like getting a degree in visual arts, really resonated with Justin and I. Um, I don't know if you saw what we were talking uh, with our music school experiences of just like, you know, getting really good at our instruments. And then once we get out there, it's like, whoa, I'm supposed to be professional, but I have no idea how to like actually be an adult and take care of all my finances and and other yeah. as- aspects of my career, even like the marketing part, sometimes we, we don't learn how to do that either. Yeah, it's cool to see that combination of something that is like what we traditionally would define as like, oh, a creative field and like mm-hmm. accounting, which people would think, oh, numbers, not creative. But then you're really making it into something maybe even more inventive because nobody else is really doing this. Like a lot of people are out there being (laughs) visual artists or being musicians, but who's out there, you know, taking that artist perspective and putting into something that is basic and everyone needs like accounting. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really organic to me just because artists like, you know, creative people are my community. It is, I mean, I am still an artist. I have a solo show show coming up next year that I'm preparing for at the moment. Um, So it's not like I stopped being an artist. I am one. And I, I like, I always say this to people, like the thing is when you're a young artist, like it's really easy to be sort of focused on yourself. And there's so much you have to learn and figure out. Like, of course you are, you're, you're building up your technical skills, like as a musician or as a painter you have to know your craft really well, but then all the professional development stuff is like so intimidating and we don't get enough guidance on it. So that's hard too. But to me, the thing that's so incredible about being a creative person ultimately is the community. Like, Mm. I don't think if I just had to do it all alone, I don't think I'd be an artist anymore, like almost 20 years out. But the fact is I get to be about around artists all the time it's who my community is. And it's so, it's such a wonderful place to be. Like, I just love creative people because we're so generous with each other. 
we share, I mean, here you guys are like with this wonderful podcast and like sharing resources with all these creative people. Like you are a, a totally amazing example of exactly the thing I'm talking about. Like we share, right? We, we want to lift up each other and like share our knowledge and resources. And I just, that generosity and sense of community, that's not universal. That's not how accountants behave. I can tell you that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and, and I will also say like, I'm completely surprised at how much I like running a business. Like it's difficult. It's very challenging, but, um, it's actually pretty creative at the end of the day. And so, and getting to be creative, like, I feel like I get to break the mold because like, you know, what is it? What does an accounting firm for creative people look like? I don't know. I get to invent that. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. um, In a way, like, I feel like we complain a lot about how, you know, getting a creative degree sometimes can feel demoralizing because people don't take you seriously or you Mm -hmm. get a skill that is not super practical in the real world, especially when it comes to finances. But I think at the same time you do, by spending so many years developing your creativity and and working on your craft, we do kind of develop like a lifestyle, a mindset of creativity. And that does make it so that, you know, when you're running a business or when you're doing something, it feels intuitive, right? Like a lot of, mm. I didn't learn a lot of marketing tactics, but I'm used to using my brain in, in different ways and, and trying to put unlike things together. So when it came to marketing for a creative baggage, for example, like I had all these cool ideas and I didn't know if they were industry standard or not, but I was willing to try them. And then it turns mm-hmm. out like sometimes it works really well or other times people would be like, oh yeah, that is the standard thing that we do in this industry. But I just didn't even know it just came kind of intuitively because I was trying different ways to get the word out there, for example. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. Isn't it funny too how like sometimes what blows my mind is just learning that there is a standard and like that's the mind-blowing thing because we have so little exposure to that (laughs) stuff in art school. (laughs) (laughs) So like, it's cool to break the mold. It's cool to invent it all yourself. But sometimes it's just nice to know like what's normal and to just do that. (laughs) (laughs) Like I just recorded a podcast. I have my own podcast called the Sunlight Podcast. And um, I just recorded an episode called The Break Even Point. Mm. And the subtitle is Proof That You're Doing Just Fine. Oh, I loved Um, that episode. I listened to it recently. Thanks. (laughs) But I think... I think like when I learned about the break even episode and yes, I mean, I feel like I have sort of expansive creative thinking, which is my training as an artist. But when I learned, you know, in school for accounting, when I learned about the break even point, which is a pretty basic business concept, like it is very normal. I was like, oh my God, wait, I'm not a failure. Everybody I work with is not a failure. This is, we're all doing just fine. (laughs) And I was like, this is the proof. And it's just, it's funny how I think like when you don't get an education in things like your money and managing your business, like you feel like you might be doing something wrong at any time. You have just a massive insecurity. And so learning the standards sometimes releases you so uh, much from that burden because you're like, oh, wait, it's normal to not make any money for a while. Like Mm. Uber didn't make money for a long, (laughs) long time. So I'm fine. (laughs) Can you explain to our listeners who haven't heard that episode yet what exactly the break-even point is and the concept of, you know, not making money right away? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, sure. (laughs) So just to kind of back it out to like where I see a lot of creative people coming from, I mean, because I do taxes for creative people, right? So, and I, I do tax, primarily I do tax education. But so what I see when people come in and talk to me is like, they feel like they're not entitled to the stuff that everybody else is entitled to, right? They, they will come and say like, oh, well, my business isn't big enough to file a Schedule C. I'm not big enough to be official yet. Like I don't have enough profit to be official. And I'm like, no, 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 you have that totally wrong. You're already official. Like you can already be taking all these benefits. And, and in fact, you're missing out that you're not. So that's the baseline. That's where the sort of creative people I see are coming from. And then here's the economic concept. So the break-even point, 
basically all it is, is this kind of wonderful moment in the course of any business, whether you're a musician, artist, Uber, doesn't matter, where, you know, basically you start, you st- any business has to start with expenses first, right? People don't start bringing money in the door until they've set something up, some mechanism to bring money in. So a lot of artists think they're the ones who are behind because they have money going out the door and not money coming in. But the break-even point proves how normal that is because your business cannot make money as a function of, you know, its operations until it exists. Right. (laughs) Like it sounds so obvious when you say it that way, but it has to exist first. Right. So how is it going to exist? Well, you're going to have to take some money out of your personal stuff and invest it into the business to get your operations going. If you were, you know, a pizza shop, you would do that by you'd have to have a physical location. You would have to have an oven. You would have to have flour. Right. You can't make money from selling pizzas until you have those things like a place to make it ingredients to make it an oven to cook it in right nobody thinks the pizza joint is like stupid or terrible or backwards because they're not making money yet when they're still building their pizza oven right it's just a necessary step on the way to make eventually making a profit so Mm -hmm. a lot of artists of course we're the same but we don't realize it we think we're dumb and stupid or doing it all wrong or missing something because we have to spend money to set up our studio. Or if you're a musician, how are you spending your money? Like going to lots and lots of auditions, auditions, like renting practice space, maybe, um, maybe it's like recording studio time. Um, right. And then you have to circulate that stuff and you have to build a reputation and you have to like gather a client list, whatever it is that you're going to, is eventually going to bring in the money going to take some time to build it to the point where the money starts coming in. So the break-even point is just the concept where your expenses, the break-even point is the moment when the money coming in is equal to the money going out. So you haven't even made a profit yet when Mm -hmm. you hit the break-even point. All the break-even point is, is it's that magical, wonderful moment that you should celebrate where you have enough income coming in that it covers the expenses. So you're at zero instead of negative. So Mm. it's proof that you're normal (laughs) and you're doing just (laughs) fine. (laughs) So how do you determine then, like, what is a sound investment to start? Because I think we come out of school and we're like, oh my God, I just spent so much money on this degree. I already spent so much money on my instrument, which is really expensive. And oftentimes Mm -hmm. that's, you know, even a little guilt of like, oh, my parents invested in that because maybe I got my flute when I was still in like high school or something. Yeah. Um, and so it already feels like we've invested so much time and so much money. But now that I'm a professional, there are a lot of things that I don't have access to anymore because I'm not in school anymore, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you determine which are the things that are going to get you to that break-even point and which are the things that maybe like, would be are nice to haves or like, oh, it would make me seem more professional, but it doesn't actually contribute to me getting from the beginning of my career to like a landing point. Yeah. That's a tough question. I have to think about that a little bit. And I'm not sure that that would look the same for everyone, but certainly when you're an entrepreneur, people talk about like revenue generating activities. So that's a thing. That's a concept that you can take away. Um, I mean, I do think that there is, um, spending that some people do as a form of procrastination or a way to not take action. And you do have to be aware of what that is in your life. That might look a little different to different people. For some people, um, maybe a visual artist that might look like making endless, 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 tiny tweaks on your website. Um, you know, the fact is like, okay, yeah. So you need a website, you need to put your images up, it should look professional, but then you you can call it done. You need to call it done and you need to move to the next thing. Um, if you wanted to infinitely improve it, you could, but then you would never make a sale. Like there's other things you need to do. So to me in general, like outreach is something that I think a lot of us don't do nearly enough of. 
that's another area where knowing the standards in other businesses is very helpful to help you feel like less of a failure. Um, because, you know, like an artist applying to grants, like it is a good day if you get 20 rejections and one success. Like that's an awesome, awesome day. But it feels really hard to get like 20 rejections, right? <laughs> like, the fact is, like, if you look at any other business, they actually like track metrics really carefully. In fact, in my business, I do now. We're like, you know, X, you know, like a sales conversion rate of 2% is excellent, right? So for every 50 applications I send out, one of them will come back and be positive. In, in the world I'm in now, sort of online courses, that's a great success rate. So I think a lot of artists, like when you think about that, are you reaching out? I mean, I don't know if those numbers exactly translate to fine arts or music, but like, what is the outreach you're doing? Outreach is generally a revenue generating activity ultimately. And most of us are not doing anywhere close to enough of it. So I would say we can put some emphasis there. Oh yeah, it's scary. Justin and I were having a conversation about this recently because we're trying to get the word out for our database. And Mm -hmm. in the beginning, I was kind of really carefully calculating in my head, like, who to ask, like, who would this resonate with? Who do I know, like, will respond and, and respond positively? And I was so careful that I had a very, very high success rate because, like, most of the people Mm -hmm. I asked, I intuitively knew we're going to like it. And that's cool, but you exhaust that really quickly. And so of then course. Justin kind of took over and he's just been like emailing all the schools, like every single music school in the country. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy thing to do in my in my downtime, but <laughs> Well, that's awesome. Be proud of yourself because you know a lot of people are really scared to get the nose and they don't do anything yeah. because of that. So Yeah, I still am. (laughs) But it's cool because like he'll send me, you know, like emails that he has gotten back and like the ratio again, compared to how many emails he sent, we haven't gotten that many responses. But it is surprising that like people do respond and they do respond positively when we get them. And the Um, cool thing about it, too, that we were just talking about is that like we wouldn't have any reason to have connections with any of these people that are now replying to us and that we're starting dialogues with. And so mm. like, we don't have any business really knowing these people outside of the fact that we're, just, you know, manually reaching out to them and just kind of cold, cold emailing all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's really like, I know that this stuff is super intimidating to people, but I just, um, it, my, and my my orientation is as an artist trying to look for galleries and shows, which, you know, where you get rejected a lot and it's really, really difficult <laughs> to make it happen. There's a lot of artists asking. But I think that in situations like the one you're talking about, outreach to music schools, outreach to galleries, whatever it is, like, it's really, really important to remember that you are just forming relationships. Like, ultimately, that's what it is. Anytime you are violating principles of a basic human relationship, it's not going to be a good, successful outcome. Like you just have to remember it's a human on the other end. Like if you, if you always keep that in mind, you're probably going to do better. You know, like the person you're outreaching to is not a robot. They probably have a life and you can ask about it. You could be curious (laughs) about them as a human being. I've found that like when I'm trying to engage with like, curators or museum workers or like people at the front desk at a gallery so many of those people in like arts admin positions are themselves artists 100 this is my secret little trick is like 100 percent of the time if you ask like hey do you make art (laughs) they're so excited to be seen in that way they're so happy to talk to you and you're the first person who's asked them all day and they're like oh my god i am yeah. Oh my God. You want to hear about my project? And you're like, yeah, I totally do. And like, just express some curiosity and some interest in the other human being. I mean, like nobody has to be taught this when you're trying to make friends, but it's like, somehow we forget that we want to be like kind, (laughs) good people when, when it comes to business too, just don't abandon that basic principle that you already know that these are people be interested, be curious. Don't 
only talk about yourself and don't only ask for favors, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I love that. And I think it's true for everything. And it's more fulfilling to you too, because it already feels awkward, right? Like Mm -hmm. I already feel awkward if I'm making a call or like starting a conversation sometimes with things that are business related, because it's like, okay, like, Mm It doesn't hurt to try, and I've had to get over that fear. Um, Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, like, what if they think that I just want something from them? Um, Mm -hmm. But really, like, I mean, um, I don't know if you've talked to, like, people that you didn't really know yet on your podcast, but we've gotten to the point where we're mostly, you know, we started off chatting with our friends and people we knew, but we're mostly talking to brand new guests and like mm-hmm. that has been a really cool way for us to connect with people that are that you know we want to have a connection with or like that we really admire that we see like value in their business and what they do but then we get to sit down and just chat and like have a really cool candid conversation um mm-hmm. and like a lot of our like friends now are people that we like follow and and talk to back and forth or ask for advice or people that we've had on the show and then just kind of stayed in connection with. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, I feel like you're speaking to, you're, you're fundamentally speaking to the strength of being a creative person already, right? Like they don't call it the humanities for no reason. It's about being human. (laughs) So (laughs) we have this major advantage it's not like other people aren't human i mean everybody gets credit for that but like we are cultivating it like that's literally what we do is we cultivate ways that speak to the soul you know the spirit the vision and um so you have this kind of like magical key to the universe and like why not use it (laughs) like having a deep conversation is one of the i don't know to me that's one of the joys of being alive I i love it I'm honored to be here. We didn't know each other before this, um, besides a couple of emails. And I feel so honored to like get to know this like cool work that you guys are doing in the world. It's awesome. Yeah. Thanks so. for coming on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. I would also love to hear about your experience starting your podcast because it just launched recently. Um, what made yeah. you want to do it and and what have you learned along the way? It sounds way better than our podcast did when we first started. oh man um thank you for that compliment um well i think i there's a couple reasons one i have i do a lot of speaking i speak in front of arts groups a lot and so i've just gotten kind of comfortable talking um and i think I guess just speaking of enjoying having a conversation, like that kind of is my favorite thing in life. Like when I go to a party, I like going to parties. I like people, but what I always want to do is just pull some interesting person into a corner and just have a really deep conversation. (laughs) Um, So I guess a podcast is a kind of a natural fit for my personality and what I enjoy. So there's that. I think it's a medium that showcases what I like and how I operate well. But if I'm also honest, like, and I think it's super intimate and like you're in somebody's ears and, um, sometimes it's, it's, it's a little funny because it's sort of one way, like they're hearing you, but you're not hearing them. So it's a little funny, but it is very intimate and you can really like get into stuff. Um, and it's long form, like Instagram reels. I can barely explain Uh. any. I yeah. can barely explain any tax concept in one minute. And like, I try, but like, you know, the tax code is pretty complicated. So like, <laughs> I, I can do a really good job in six minutes, but on Instagram, that's eternity and no one will listen. So I'd rather just like, you know, be engaging, be a human. And oh, by the way, here's the difference between a Roth and a traditional IRA. <laughs> You're going to learn it. Yeah. So it's just a better medium for what I, what I want to get out there into the world. Um, and short form, you know, I don't know. Can I, can I insult reels here? They're so stupid. I hate them. (laughs) Yeah. No, I definitely agree. (laughs) Well, there's, there's definitely something about like depth that you lose by only listening to like 30 to a minute, uh, like 30 seconds to a minute reels. You can't, you can't get any real information. It's not educational past just the very basic surface level. 
Exactly. It's very surface level and I'm interested in depth. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm interested in being an artist. We used to talk about this in art school and our critiques. Like, um, this is, you know, that a painting is a conversation and that it is, um, it's long format. Like it takes weeks, months, maybe to make a painting. It's not Mm. quick. It's, I mean, there's no 30 second painting, maybe one brushstroke. (laughs) <laughs> but uh yeah. I'm just not interested. I want to put more of my heart into things and I want it and you know also if I'm going to put my heart in I want it to last a little longer. <laughs> I don't really like having to live by an algorithm that wants me on there every 24 hours. I you know honestly I've got other stuff to do. I don't want to be tied to my phone. Yeah. So. Yeah, and even though like I mean, numbers on Instagram, it's like, oh, you're more likely to reach new people and blow up. And I think that is the use for keeping Instagram alive. But it is true that like that connection that you form with your audience isn't very strong on Instagram. Like people might Mm -hmm. see something and follow you. And if you're lucky, they'll stay tuned in. But a lot of times, you know, people follow us because we had one informative posts, but then they never see our stories again, or they never see our posts on their feeds. So they don't remember who we are anymore versus Mm -hmm. when you have like that long form. And and people talk about this with YouTube too. It's like, you really feel like, you know, those creators and you really feel like you have a community, you know, even in the comment section or, or anywhere um, Mm -hmm. that you have a place to come back to that you kind of lose when things are so short and come in such like, catchy bursts you know totally yeah it's very much like for entertainment and like I use Instagram I'm not I mean I'm not totally anti and I make announcements there and I announce my podcast episodes when they drop and like it has a use but um fundamentally I'm just interested in work that is deeper than that and you know if I'm honest like a lot of business concepts tax concepts like they require some attention And so I would rather cultivate a format where people are spending a little more attention because you're just not going to learn how to manage your taxes well in 30 second chunks. You Mm. just aren't. It's too, it's too complex for that. (laughs) You have to maintain a thought for a little longer. I mean, I, I try to be as entertaining as I can, but I I can't, you know, put on sequins and confetti and make it visually, you know, animated (laughs) and get you all the info you need in 30 seconds. (laughs) I'd love to hear um, maybe as the last thing about your workshop, because then, you know, you get the back and forth of like, not just having information like given to you, but like you're actively practically using it. Um, Yeah. Tell us about how you developed it and maybe a little glimpse of what's inside. (laughs) Sure. Sure. Um, Yeah. I mean, thanks for the chance. So, I mean, basically, As a tax practitioner, because I do creative people's taxes all the time, I see their income. I see how it comes in, like what form, like how people are making money and how much they're making, where they're getting confused, where taxes are kind of hitting them and they didn't realize it, like what people are confused about. Um, And also the fact that as a tax practitioner, I have to keep really on top of tax laws as they get passed. So I read every new tax bill. Mm -hmm. I interpret them. I like, you know, so... And I also have to learn the ins and outs of the other stuff that has tax implications. So not just you doing your taxes every year, but um, retirement accounts, because those have tax benefits. So how do those work? How does tax planning work? Tax planning is basically like finding secret hidden money that's not working hard enough for you and making it work harder. Like tax planning sounds really boring, but it is like, it's finding money you already had and making it work. I mean, I think that's awesome. I need a better phrase for it. (laughs) (laughs) But I basically created a program where I take all of that knowledge of tax planning, retirement accounts, like personal finance, investing, um, and then also setting up your bookkeeping, setting up your receipts and tax document organization systems, like getting set up with a system that will serve you forever, not just one time. Um, Because I... I have a total agenda. I want artists. I think art is going to save the world. I think, you know, we're talking about being human and humanity and real relationships. I think creative people are the people teaching the rest of the world how to be human and how to, how to see each other as human again. I mean, 
God, what a problem we have with that right now as a culture. And so my agenda is I don't want artists to ever, ever, ever quit because of money. I think, you know, you don't have to make money your North Star and make it the center of everything you do, but you do need it because if you don't have it, you don't get to rest, you know? So I want every artist to have a stash of FU money. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah wow so my program is basically like um a suite of video courses and it's got quizzes that test the knowledge so that you like retain it um and know if there's areas you need to review and it's got a spreadsheet bookkeeping system that i developed that the whole point of is it, it is like about um not just getting your book set up, but it absolutely does that. It's actually about orienting it towards getting the biggest tax deductions. And like, I teach you the places like here, you want to track this same category two different ways. And so we set it up that way from the beginning, because there's lots of ways in taxes that you get to take either this or this, whichever one is bigger. So I just put those formulas right into my spreadsheet so that you always know which one is bigger. And it just, it just like makes the system like always show you where you get more money. And I, you know, that's, that's my motivation. That's my secret agenda. It's not so secret. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) so I love that because I feel like the mentality for a lot of creatives is like, oh, like I shouldn't care about money and I shouldn't care about all this other stuff because all I want to care about is my art. But I think that's Mm -hmm. when you run into trouble of like, if one day, if you're o- you've only been looking at your art or your music this whole time and you look around you and you don't have money or you're not really making ends meet and you haven't marketed yourself, so you you know, you're not building on something for yourself, that's when you get demoralized and you, the reality hits. And that's really sad because really doing all these extra things, are how you take care of yourself as an artist so that you can continue making art or making music. Absolutely. And I think sometimes we need people from the outside to remind us that what we do is genuinely important. I mean, I hope I'm here saying that to you in a way that you hear. Like the work you do as a creative person is important. I mean, I really think it's changing the world and it's important that you take care of yourself so you can continue to change the world. Because I see artists quit because of money. Like The point of taking care of this is so you can keep doing it. It is in service of your art. It actually is important to put the oxygen mask on your face. (laughs) (laughs) um, Because I see also, you know, a lot of people, I've been an artist for over 20 years. Or sorry, coming up on 20 years, 20 years if you count graduate school. Um, But I do, I've seen people quit at this point, right? And it's, it's always money. That's always what it is. And sometimes it's time, but time and money are related, right? So I think when people feel like the only way they can make it work is when they are just hustling absolutely at their max all the time. I'm just here to tell you, you cannot sustain that. Like you can do that for a couple of years. You can have a nervous breakdown and other consequences, alcoholism, uh, all kinds of stuff that can also come with that. And I'm just here to say like, it's really nice. It's a service to the people you love in your life and to your art to actually get some retirement going. (laughs) Like Mm, you may, it doesn't, it has no, it, it does not, it's actually the opposite of compromising your vision as an artist. It's actually furthering your vision as an artist. I think it's easy to get that backwards. It doesn't mean you're all about the money. It just means you're respecting yourself. You're showing yourself the self-respect to put the oxygen mask on, you know, so that you can continue to serve your art. If you're feeling inspired to take on new creative opportunities, check out our database of scholarships, grants, internships, and jobs at forthelostcreative.com. We've been working hard to build this resource for you, and we hope it makes finding your creative career path just a little less daunting.